It's good to be here this morning. Good to have all of you with us. And uh, as one brother says, this is the first day of the rest of your life. <laughs> Amen. That makes it an important day. <laughs> and it should be. It should in that sense. Um, I chose today, since this is the first day of the year in the uh, secular calendar, and you always need to be reminded that there is a secular calendar and then there is the, uh, the religious or the, uh, or the holy calendar of the Lord. And they're not the same. The secular calendar bases its keeping of time on the movement of the creation. The holy calendar bases its movement of time on the creator. Big difference. Because when the, creator created, when the Creator saved me in 1973, that's when my time started. Yes, sir, brother. Amen. And then the month, the month Abib, which is the first month in the, in the Holy Calendar, is in the springtime. Because that's the beginning of life. That's when life starts shooting forth. Men start to keeping of their time in the dead of winter. Amen. Father, bless the study of your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'm going to talk about the things that I believe. I'm going to go through seven of them. These are things that I believe, and uh, I've come to believe these things, uh, not because that it's approved by any school or fellowship or organization or what have you, uh, but it's, uh, these are the things that I believe because of conviction from studying the, studying the Scripture and from uh, prayer down through the years over these things. Uh, turn, to, turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16. And here's the first one. And the reason I list this as first is because if you don't believe this, you're not going anywhere. You're, you're, you're just not going to make it. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, let's just stop right there. What does that mean? Okay. All right, it's inspired. What does that mean? God breathed. But I know that. That's the, that's the method of transmission. But when you say that Scripture is inspired of God, what are you saying? Pardon? Exactly. But, but you're implying something. You're, you're making a, this is a, this is a statement. It came from God. This is the absolute truth. This is it. This is the scripture. I don't care what the modern uh, uh, theology is in vogue or what to whatever uh, the secular world believes right now. That's irrelevant. The scripture came from God. Therefore, it is the, it is the absolute truth. I don't know what the Hebrew word is. I'm, ruach in Hebrew is the spirit. Okay. But nephesh is the soul in Hebrew. In the Greek text, it's theos noustos. That's what the word is here. Uh, I don't know what the word is in Hebrew for inspired. I can't answer that. I've never, I've never had anybody ask me that before. Uh, we can go look it up this afternoon and find out. But you can be certain of this, that it means the same thing as the Greek word. It'll mean the same thing. God breathed. That's what the word means. All right. So therefore, if I have scripture, and this is the scripture, all right, we get the word scripture from script, which is the English word for the right, script, all right, scripture, this is the writings, this is the book, all right, this is inspired, this came from God, all right. Now, think about this for a moment. Is there any purpose in inspiring something 2,000 years ago that does not exist today? Okay, what's the point in inspiring scripture 2,000 years ago if you don't have it in your hand today? That's the point. All right, and if you can pick it up and hold that book in your hand and say, I believe that is God's word, God breathed. All right, now there's a, there's a lot of people out there that do not believe that the Bible, that any one Bible for that matter, any one Bible that you can hold in your hand and say that that is God's word. They don't believe that. Okay, they save people, good people, they love the Lord and all that, but they don't believe that. So what does that do to them? 
Now think it through for a moment. If you don't have in your hand an absolute authority, then you're going to look for an authority somewhere else. You're going to try to find it in experience or in someone's opinion or what have you, some pronouncement, some, some what have you. If you do not have it in your hands to where you can say, well, I'm making a difference what you feel, how you feel about it or what your church says about it. This is what the Bible says. Then you're saying that the Bible is the final authority. Exactly. And so, therefore, your faith, if you do not believe that there's any one book in this world that you can hold in your hands and believe that it is God's infallible word, then your faith is going to be relevant because you do not have an absolute authority. Right? Yeah, that's true. All right, now the second point is Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians 2 and verse 9. This is what I believe. In Colossians 2, 9, For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I believe in the Godhead. All right. As has been manifested in Scripture as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But the manifestation of the Godhead in Scripture as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is a very is a much, much, much more complicated thing than people take it, take it to be. You don't lay out the essence of God like you, like you would put dominoes in a, in a row. He is a mystery, and he will remain a mystery until he manifests himself to us, and we shall see him as he is, and no one has seen that yet. But God, God Almighty, manifested himself. In other words, he made himself known to flesh, in flesh, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was all, he is almighty God. So how do I understand that? I just understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, as far as I know, uh, as far as he takes us and as far as he will let us know, he is almighty God. If he is almighty God, there is no God apart from him. Right? I mean, think these things through. You say, well, what about God the Father? Is he a separate God? No, he's no separate God. There's only one God. Amen. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, one God. That's called the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse 4. Israel based their faith on the simple fact in the Old Testament that, here's a big high-sounding word, and I know you've heard it before, monotheist, monotheistic. Mono means one theist God or one God, all right? Polytheist or is, is a person who believes in many God. Pantheist believes that God is in everything. All kinds of, all kinds of uh, takes on that word theist. There are theist and there are deist. A theist believes in God. A deist believes that there is a God who made it and then sat back and is going to watch it and see how it goes. He has no, he has no real personal... Uh, put, he, has, he has no personal input or no real concern about what's happening. He kind of observes everything. That's deism. And we've had a lot of deists down through the years. But a theist is one who believes that there is a creator God. And that creator God is concerned about what's going on in this world. But you must take it a little step further. Who is he? When Paul got to Athens, Greece, he got in the midst of, uh, of the... Uh, they had, this, this was the product of the golden age of Greece which was about 300 B.C. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are the three pillars of Greek philosophy. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. One taught the other who taught the other. One was a student of the other who was a student of the other. They believed that there was a successive steps of godhood. and They believed in, a, in, this, in this kind of a mystic spirit world. And they believed in... Uh, that God could be known, but he could only be known in a, in a kind of an esoteric, in other words, an inward, spiritual type way where you have to communicate with spirits into the spirit world. They, they laid the foundation of Gnosticism. They laid the foundation of Gnosticism. And so when the, Lord, and so when the Apostle Paul got to Athens, Greece, he saw, a, he saw an altar to the unknown God. They didn't want to offend any of them, see. And they, didn't, they couldn't be certain of all the gods, see. Unknown God. These 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 uh, these uh, these Athenians were polytheist. This demiurge. They believed a demiurge was the God up here that did the creation, but there may be a God above him and gods below him. This is the problem with the unknown God. You don't know him personally. 
So the Apostle Paul seized upon that opportunity to say to them, well, let me tell you about the one you don't know. Yeah. That was wisdom. <laughs> it was. And he stood at Mars Hill, and I've stood on Mars Hill, and he looked up at the Pantheon right above him, the Pantheon, where inside the Pantheon, Pan means the Panth, the uh, <clears throat> Pan means a spread, a broad theon, theos, a spreading abroad of God. And inside that building, they had a female God. You know who it was? Who was that female God inside that big building up there on the top of the, of the, uh, this, of the, well, the Pantheon? It was in a building called the Parthenos. Yeah, Diana. Well, Diana was the Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Sophia was the name. Sophia was the name. In every culture, they had a feminine god. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this, in this, in this, in this Parthenos, they had Athena the Virgin. That's why it's called the the uh, the word the word for virgin in Greek is is uh, is uh, Athena. All right. But there's another word for virgin in Greek was Parthenos. The word used for the Lord Jesus Christ when Mary was born in Bethlehem of Judea, a Parthenos, a woman who had never known a man. That was the Greek word used for it. So they had a female God. Yes. Athena. And she's known as Athena. She's known as Artemis. She's known as Sophia. She's known as, uh, as uh, Aphrodite. She's known uh, by all kinds of names. They all have their own take on it, and they all put their own little spin on it for their culture, but it's all the same thing. You remember the Old Testament? He said you bake cakes to the who of heaven? Queen, queen of heaven. See? The queen of heaven. And so when the apostle got to Athens, Greece, he got in the midst of uh, Greek philosophy, and they were, the, they were the learned people of the world, folks. I mean, all you got to do is go to Athens, go to Greece and go to Athens and go to the ruins of Athens and look at what kind of a culture these people had built. And all you, do, all you have to do is to travel from Athens, Greece, and huge marble structures that are beautiful. With this, this Athena the Virgin, they say, I think was something like 30 to 40 feet tall inside the Parthenos. All right. And you can, you can look at that, look at the beauty of this place, and then travel about, uh, oh, about, uh, about, a th about 1,200, 1,300 miles north, and they're living in mud huts. Is there a difference? As far as their standing before God, there is no difference. But as far as the advancement of human culture, they're worlds apart. They're worlds apart. And that's what we're talking about. The Apostle Paul said, I came to tell you about this unknown God. And the and New Testament, the New, one of the proofs of the, New, of, the, of the inspiration of the New Testament is the fact that it never gets into all these gods. In other words, it never believes in them. It may, it may be mentioned, but there's only one true living God. And that's from Genesis to Revelation. The New Testament and the Old Testament never, never come into agreement with the pagan philosophies of their day or the pagan misunderstanding of the Godhead. And so I believe in the Godhead. Do I fully understand the Godhead? No way, Jose. But I believe in the Godhead. And I believe the Lord Jesus is Almighty God. Now look over here in John chapter number 3 and verse number 3. John 3, 3. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you'll notice, the terminology is not saved. Saved is a Bible word. Saved is a fine word. But, a lot of, but the Old Testament saints were not born again. They were saved, but not born again. Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does that mean, preacher? It means that you must literally... Take on a completely new life. That life is of God. And that life can only come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Second man, last Adam. The Apostle Paul compares the first man with the second man. He compares the first Adam with the last Adam. The reason he does that is because the first man is of the earth earthy. That Adam handed to you death and destruction. The second man is the Lord from heaven. He gave you life and eternal life, which is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, when he was here on this earth, he could save. He could save, and he saved, and he kept. And he told the Lord in John chapter number 17, he said, All that you've given me, I have kept. And, and, and only one, the son of perdition, is the only one. It wasn't mine to begin with. But I've kept every one of them. The reason he had to keep them is because they weren't born again yet. So he kept them by his own power. But when he died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day, he rose in the life of the last Adam. Life from the dead. Life that is victor over death, hell, and the grave. Life that lives forever. And it is the life that had never lived before. For God had never died. But the God-man did die. And then when he rose from the dead, he rose with the power of resurrection life. That's the life he gives to believers. That's what the new birth is about. That's why one born again doesn't have to fear death. And death has no power over him. This is why Paul cried out in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Mocked it. He's mocking death. And oh, grave, where is thy victory? <laughs> Amen. That's what he's doing, mocking it, folks. So I believe in salvation, new birth. How much of the new birth do you hear preached today from these feel-good churches? You know what you hear from them? What you hear from these feel-good churches is come in here now and commit your life to Christ and let's get your family in church and, and we're going to teach you how to live a prosperous life and feel good about yourself and everything's going to be just fine in the end. That's about, as, that's about the depth of the message. That's about as far as it goes. In Titus chapter number 1 and verse number 5, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. It'll help you find it like that. Titus is a little short book in the Bible. Titus chapter number 1 and verse number 5. In Titus 1, 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, now watch carefully, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Now who is this? He's talking, an elder, that's what I am. I'm an elder. That's one of the titles that I have. I'm an elder. I'm also a bishop. That's another title that I have. All elders are not bishops. All, all preachers are not bishops. But I, all pastors are bishops. I'm a bishop and I'm a pastor. And I'm an elder. And I have been ordained. But I have not been ordained by some ecclesiastical hierarchy. That's what's important. There is no church office somewhere in Nashville or in Atlanta or wherever or in Rome that oversees this local assembly. Then you have an aberration. You have something that is man-made. So what do you mean by that? That means that you really have no say-so in what goes on in your church. And the church, I believe, should be autonomous. It should be. That's a big word, but let me break it down for you. How many of you have ever driven an automobile? <laughs> Do you know what that word literally means? When you break it down? Automobile. Auto is a Greek preposition, autos, all right? Automobile. What's the word mobile mean? Move, move about. The word autos, auto, auto. It means self. So what's it say? Self-moving, horseless, no horse pulling it. It's self-moving. It's an automobile. See, it moves. It, you can't tell how it's moving. It's just moving. It's moving of itself. Of course, you know it's got a motor in it. All right. Autonomy. Namas is law. Okay? Auton, autonomous. Autonomy. autonomy. That means self-law or self-governing. That's a big word and it's an important word. What's that mean, preacher? It means that the church governs itself. I believe in that. I don't believe in some hierarchy coming to govern you. I believe the church ought to have the right to pick and choose its pastors. And if you get yourself a dictator and a devil, get rid of him. But there are churches all over this land, folks, who have no say-so in their pastor. They're appointed by a religious hierarchy. That's no good. That's no good. That's no good at all. So I believe in an autonomous, self-governing, and that has to do with polity. Not politics, but polity. <laughs> There's a big difference between the two words. 
Polity has to do with the order of the way the church conducts itself and its authority. And the church polity should be in the hands of the people. I believe that, don't you? I believe that in this nation we have a democratic republic. Thank God the majority does not rule. Amen. Amen. Thank God you're governed by law. Do you know where the seat of democracy was located? Do you know where it came from? I just told you a little while ago. The Apostle Paul was in there and he was on Mars Hill looking up at the Pantheon, the spread of gods, and to the Parthenos, into the building that, that housed Athena, the virgin. It came from Athens, Greece. That's where, do you know where the Republic came from? The idea of Republic governed by law? It came from Rome. So, like it or lump it, we're still dealing with the Romans and the Grecians. Amen. All right. Should the church order its business the way the world runs its business? No. When the world makes a decision, it makes it based upon what's prosperous or whatever's, whatever's best for this group or that group. The church ought to make its decision after it's been on its knees in prayer before God because it is a living organism. It is a unity of believers. And there's a vast difference in the way the church, is, the church orders its business and the way the world does its business. It's a horrible thing for somebody to come into a church and try to cause the church to run its business just like somebody would run IBM or CBS or General Electric or Ford Motor Company or something like that. It won't work. You ought to have a say-so in everything that goes on in this church. If you are a member of Temple Baptist Church, there should be no select secret committees meeting somewhere to determine what all goes on inside that church. It should be the voice of the people as a group of believers because you're not a schismatic body, you're one body. You're not broken into a dozen different uh, pieces. You are one body and that one body should have a voice as one body. Don't ever let them take that away from you. If the Lord takes me from this earth and you call another pastor in here, don't let them start creating secret committees and, 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 a little, and, and investing power in a little group right over here. Leave the power with the people. Leave it with the people. And don't let somebody be able to get up in front of you and say, well, our group has met and we don't feel like this man is qualified anymore to be here or this or that or we want to do this. No, 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 no. You get up in front of the people and say, how many of you want to do this and how many of you don't want to do it? You make your vote and the majority wins because that's the body of Christ. That's the way I've felt for 35 years ever since I've been here. And I feel like that that is definitely the way that a church business should be run. Now I want you to turn to Mark chapter number 4 and verse 11. Mark 4:11. Mark chapter number 4 and verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. All right, now, I've listened to this lady from Vanderbilt University. She's real smart. She's a professor of religion at Vanderbilt. I've listened to uh, some of these, uh, one I think the University of Chicago, and uh, some of these theological seminaries across the country, anytime the, the History Channel or some of them do a, do, do a special on, uh, for example, the birth of Christ or the early apostles or what have you, they'll interview these people. They want to know what they have to say about it. And without exception, every last one of them approaches it on a scholarly level as if they were reading Shakespeare or, or, or something of that nature. They have no insight at all into the spiritual context of what's going on. Amen. Note carefully. I have, I, have, I, have, I have a firm belief in eschatology. Now, that's another big word, but it's, it's a conjunction of two words. It's the conjunction of the Greek word eschatos, and the ology on the end is the wisdom of. Like psychology is the wisdom of the soul, supposed to be anyway. All right, eschatology, what's that mean? Eschatos in Greek is last or the end. So eschatology is the doctrine of last things, and that's a big deal, folks. What's going to happen in the end? Now, generally speaking, it's broken down into three categories, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. Believe me, in either group, any of those groups among the three, you will find people who love the Lord that are, that are absolutely believers in Christ that would give their life for him because I've read their works and there's no doubt that they love the Lord Jesus. I am premillennial. 
Now in premillennial, you can break that down. It even is even broken down further. You have premillennial who believe in the calling up or the catching up of the church of the living God. And I can't believe that somebody would be premillennial and wouldn't believe in that. I'm premillennial. I believe that God's going to come and catch the church up. He's going to come and call it to himself. But here's the issue. Here's where the rub comes. When is he going to do that? Among premillennial brethren, you have those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, those who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, and those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe the Lord's going to come, catch his bride up, to meet him in the clouds, meet him in the air. But don't you notice something about this? Notice what he said. He said, it is given unto you to know, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of what? All right, look at John 3, 3 again. Hold your place right there and look over at John chapter number 3 and verse number 3. John 3, 3. What's it say, Brother Gibson, in John 3, 3? Cannot see what? Cannot see the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. He said to his disciples, it is given unto you, not to them, but unto you, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. This is why the professor of religion at the University of Vanderbilt, the University of Chicago, and all the rest of them can never understand the spiritual content of the last days. The reason is because they've never been born again. They're not saved. They see, they see the Lord Jesus in a historical context as a great teacher, great man, wonderful, laid, you know, he gave us great precepts that we can follow today, make ourselves better, better life, blah, blah, all relative stuff. But as far as accepting him as their Lord Jesus Christ, born again, believer in him, no way, no way, not for a moment. Because in order to be born again, first of all, you've got to be lost. You can't get a man saved till he's lost. When he gives up, and it seems like it's elementary and, and it would be kindergarten theology, but it's the truth. Nobody's lost anymore. <laughs> Hasn't the devil worked quite a one on them? They're all spiritual and they're all religious, but they're not lost. Well, I'll read a letter to you in just a moment in, in when I preach this morning that'll break your heart that I just got this morning on our prayer page the first day of 2012. It's one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. Yes, sir, brother. Why would uh, missionary Baptists uh, have preached that? Uh, I had, had one preach one time. He was ordaining a bunch of uh, deacons, and what happened to a little friend of mine? And I could have hit on the table if there had been a table to hide them because he was saying that us premillennials were sending people straight to hell. You know, that, that's kind of a, well, that's, isn't that sad? You heard what I said about the awe and the post millennial. I know a dear brother out here in the halls. He loves the Lord, no doubt in my mind, but he's not premillennial. And uh, uh, for somebody to make a statement like that, he says it out of frustration. He's frustrated because he can't, he can't deal with them out of the scripture. You know, if you want to sit down with him and say, well, let's open the Bible, let's compare notes here. Let's see what you believe and what I believe, what you believe. I... No, no, he's just, he's just angry and he's frustrated and he's taking it out by making a, making a, a stupid statement like that. Well, I knew that uh, I was the only one there. <laughs> premillennial. Yeah. yeah, you were the only premillennial? Did they, anybody know that? <laughs> they knew you were? <laughs> It'd be an uncomfortable place to be. <laughs> Yeah, I don't say that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a minute, that just because a man doesn't agree with me on eschatology, he's going to hell. I don't believe that for a minute. I don't believe he's sending people to hell. Do you believe that? Good. No. no. It is cult-like. But that's what happens. It's like when you're running for office, if you can't run on your record, what do you do? You dig up all the dirt you can and whatever you can do against your opponent. But you never deal with the issues because you've already failed in the issues. Just a little hint about what's coming in 2012 <laughs> in November. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, 
Right. They're redefining him. Oh yeah. Yeah, they were taking little bits and pieces and occupation and there were some other people doing the same thing that he was more popular. And there's a PhD from Boston and New York and all over the country. And I right. said to myself, you know, how could they Well here's here's the way a man like that thinks. Now if you if you really got he'd never tell you this. But he's got a PhD, okay. Now that takes a lot of a lot of time. Usually at least about six years, seven years maybe. You've got first a bachelor, then a master. Then you have to make a thesis on PhD, do some research and all that. You're a master in your in your in your uh, in your discipline of study, and he gets into that, and he and he and he's proud of his education. He's proud of his wisdom, and he knows he's smarter. He wouldn't be where he is, and uh, and then he becomes jealous of this Jesus, this this Jewish carpenter that lived two thousand years. So he diminishes him, but he can't do away with him. He's smarter than that. He knows that the historical evidence supports it completely, but here's what eats him up. He knows a hundred years from now, nobody will even know he ever lived, but they'll still be talking about Jesus. That's, that's what eats him up. <laughs> right. Oh, to them, absolutely. Yeah, to them, yes. Well, they thought he was crazy. Sure. It's, uh, uh, well, you know, <laughs> they were the first to be called doctors. Doctor of philosophy, Ph.D. All right. It takes in a wide area of learning. The philosophy, what's that mean? Well, that goes, that, that's not just one discipline. That's a whole wide, broad spectrum. And used to, the doctor was called, the medical doctor was called a physician in the Bible. Luke is the physician, not the doctor, see. And then the term doctor later on was applied to, the, to, a, to a medical doctor, which is fine. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just observing things here. But the Ph.D. has been around a long time because Hillel, Shammai, these were doctors of the law. The term doctor is used of these people because they were masters in, the, in that area of study. And when they reached that, uh, that cost them a pile of money to get there, too. That's not cheap. I mean... I know it. I it uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I came from a little podunk rule over here on the hill, you know. They, they closed it down. But uh, I'm, I'm proud of my school. I, we learned how to read over there, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and thank God. <laughs> it is, the wisdom of this world. The Bible said through wisdom, God chose that through the wisdom of this world, they would never know God. They will never know him. They will never discover him, find him, examine him, break him down, you know, and, and put him under a microscope. They can't do it because that would show that they were superior to him because he could be examined. No, he will only reveal himself. That means he's in control. The only thing you'll ever know about God is what God reveals himself to be. That means he's in complete control. And not only that, who he is and where he is. Where is he? Somebody said he's in heaven. Show me where heaven is. Somebody point to heaven right now. All right, that's good. But what about Australia? They're on the other end of the globe. If they point to heaven down there, they're pointing straight down 180 degrees from us. Right? Right? <laughs> Sydney, Australia got to, didn't you see the fireworks when Sydney, Australia was celebrating the new year? What was it? At least, what, 12, 14 hours ahead of us? All right, that's in the southern hemisphere. All right. You realize that we're walking around facing this way. They're walking around facing down that way. You understand that, don't you? Either we're upside down or they're upside down. And when they point up, they're pointing down. We point up there. We're pointing down to them. <laughs> the philosopher would talk about the perspective because the philosopher would immediately go into the relativism of it. Sure he would. Yes, sir. Well, I don't know if I'm on top or bottom. Do you? <laughs> I know. Well, he calls time to be no more, so he had to start it, didn't he, brother? Over there in Revelation. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Am I on the top or am I on the bottom? Which one are we? Are you on the top of the earth or the bottom of the earth? You're on a circle. 
I'm going to heaven. I'm going to the third heaven. I'm going to where God is. And I'm not interested in any direction. But we do know that the north star is Alpha Draconis. We do know that this universe, the stars of it, revolve around it. Draconis is there at the north star. We do know that the constellations, which is called Maseroth in the book of Job, here in the northern hemisphere is laid out for us, and we can see it. And yet there are parts of the constellation you have to be in the southern hemisphere to see. Understand that. So why is it that Job's talking about that? Because Job, obviously, is in the northern hemisphere looking up into the heavens that we look into, right? All right, so you Australians, you're on the wrong end. Amen. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I don't get Australia mad at me. Good night. All right. Turn to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28, verse 19. All right. Matthew 28, verse 19. These are some of the last words the Lord spoke. And here's what he said. He gave a commission. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all, peop all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. All right. That's the Baptist commission. Let me give you the Pentecostal commission. Turn to Mark chapter 16. I like to mess with your mind. <laughs> The whole idea is messing with your mind to make you think. All right, here's, the, here's, the, here's our brethren, and they are our brethren. They love the Lord. Yeah, just like us, they got lost in their midst, just like the Baptists have lost in their midst. But the Pentecostals have born-again believers that love the Lord Jesus, just like you have. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, Mark chapter number 16 and verse number uh, 15. Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All right, Baptists and Pentecostals can both agree on that. He that believeth and is, uh-oh, baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now watch this. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Well, I can get a lot of Baptists to agree with that. A lot of Baptists won't agree with that, but a lot of Baptists will. They shall speak with new tongues. Uh-oh. They shall take up serpents. I know some folks up in the hills of Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia. They get very serious about that. Yes, they do. They get very serious about it, folks. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, they get serious about that, too. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. Now, I can get a lot of Baptists to agree with, the, with me there. And they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following, Amen. Now, forget whether I believe anything. Ask yourself this, what do you believe? And why do you believe it? See, ask yourself what you believe. And why you believe it. Remember, you're held accountable for what you believe, not what I believe. You see, I, I, how long have I known that's been in there? <laughs> Since 1973. How many times have I read that? I couldn't count. I wouldn't even try to tell you how many times I've read that. How many times have I read over there in Acts chapter number 10? On the day when, uh, when, uh, when Peter was preaching to Cornelius. And Peter later on recounted what had happened. He said the same thing happened to them. that happened to us. In Acts chapter number 2, the Bible says that 16 different uh, nationalities, people, groups, ethnicity, whatever, were there. And the Holy Spirit came down upon them and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know what it did? I got to digging real hard. I said, okay now, what's this other tongues thing? What is this? I had to be satisfied in myself. What's going on? The Apostle Paul says, that uh, he says, forbid not to speak in tongues in the book of 1 Corinthians. I thought, well, I got to deal with this. I got to deal with it. So I started going out to Pentecostal churches. I've been all over the place in Pentecostal churches, been to Pentecostal meetings, met some of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life, loved the Lord, no doubt in my mind. I did discover that a lot of people in the Pentecostal church are seeking for something in tongues, 
and in a genuine heart, a genuine heartfelt desire to do it. But just like a lot of people, they don't want to put on anything. They don't. They want it to be real. How many you know? How many know what I'm talking about now? When they do something, they want it to be real. So they're waiting for this gift from God to be able to speak in tongues, and it doesn't come to them. Okay, I learned that. I learned that first time. I'm talking about what I read, anybody. I learned it, okay? This is not being critical. This is being observant. So you have an element that wants to teach them how to do that. And they're probably sincere in what they're trying to do and all that. But that raised a red flag with me. In my young Christian walk, I'm talking about, folks, a long time ago. Because I sincerely wanted to know what's going on with the tongues thing, what's happening here. And had these that want to teach them how. I thought, if this is of God, you don't need anybody to teach you how to be saved. You don't need to be, teach you. When you receive the Holy Ghost, there's nobody needs to teach you you've got the Holy Spirit. So I began to think to myself, well, now what is the tongues thing? So I got to digging a little deeper into it. In Acts chapter number 2, it says plainly that every man heard in his own what? It was a discernible language. All right. I still, had to, I still had to square that, though, with the people that I knew they loved the Lord. I know they love the Lord. I know that. Yet they're speaking in this, what they call, unknown tongue. And so I said, now, Lord, what's going on here? Because I can't see what they're doing as to what this Bible's talking about. I can't see that. I can't, I can't I, in my heart of hearts, I don't believe what they're doing is what the Bible's talking about. Are you following me on this? He says, they, live, they believe, they love the Lord. This is their thing. This is what they do. They do this because they think this is the power of God. They think God has them do this. They do this. It comes out of them. They do it. Did you get that? They do it. I was more settled, satisfied with that than anything else. That means they're sincere. They love the Lord. They're doing what they think they, they, they should be doing. They're doing what they think tongues are. They're doing it. We'll let them do it but I don't accept it Amen. as the Bible. Yes, sir. Well, he can, he can use it, sure. Sure he can, he can, he can. Yes, sir. Well, the apostle in 1 Corinthians 14 says that tongues are given for a sign, and the sign is for them that believe not. Usually it has to do with Jews. Unbelieving Jews, the sign. And, and, and he also warned them in 1 Corinthians about everybody coming together and has a prophecy and has a word and all that. He said they'll think you're mad. The place of tongues in the New Testament is one of the most controversial things in the Bible. There's one thing you can know for certain. You can know the tongues in Acts chapter number 2 are languages. 16 different languages present, all right? Nobody can tell me they're speaking in tongues and force me to believe it if they can't agree with, with Acts chapter number 2. All right? That's a language. That's a language. Now, I heard one teach not too long ago. He said, he said, when we speak in tongues, he said, it is a language that is understood somewhere on this earth. I have never heard it put that far. I thought, you're taking a giant leap. Right. Or have an interpreter. Yeah. Oh, you told them that? <laughs> you know why? They were not certain. Exactly. And if you... Ex exactly. If you deal with them the right spirit, I think you can help a lot of folks and, and, and win them. If you can talk to them in the right spirit. Don't just come down and say, oh, bless God, that's demonism and all of that stuff. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't get into the Brownsville revival and into the, into the, into the quaking and the barking and all. That's a new thing altogether. But, you know, that's, that's, we're talking about old mainline Protestant, uh, old mainline Pentecostals. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the new charismatic everything goes movement. New Age movement. I'm talking about old mainline Pentecostal and the, and the young people who are practicing the old mainline Pentecostal faith. They're good people. But I don't buy into the, I don't, I, I don't accept it. I, I just can't in my heart. It doesn't match the scripture. 
And but I, I believe the way to deal with it, you don't. You got to be ha deal with them right. Yes, sir. Well, that's to them. See, they take they take this progression. Re speaking in tongues is the obvious sign that you've received the Holy Spirit. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's the progression. And what they've done is, and and the thing the thing is that you look back at them and say, well, now you mean to tell me that what you're doing that I can't even agree with is proof that you've received the Holy Spirit and a changed life on my part. When I'm no longer what I used to be and love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I mean I am not what I used to be. At 10 o'clock last night, I wasn't interested in going out here getting drunk anywhere, <laughs> dancing on somebody's floor, running out here wild and crazy. It, you know what it meant to me last night at 10 o'clock? Zero. I went to bed. Amen. Yes, sir. Sure they can. Sure, I am. You need to get to the point to where you can have a relationship with the Lord and know you're standing with God without pulling somebody else down. That's very important. Just leave the people where they are. Let them, let them, they love the Lord. Let them do what they're doing. But be able to give an answer for what you believe. And when some comes to you, or some young believer comes to you and says, do I need to speak in tongues? Say, if God gives you the gift of tongues, hallelujah, glory to God. But go to Acts chapter number 2 and it will be right there. He said, with another tongue, he'll speak to these people. And if the gift of tongues has been given, and on occasion I have read stories where God has spoken through people in a language they did not know, but people were present who knew it and understood every word that was being said, and a, a language was spoken and they had never learned that language. God can do anything. God can do anything. I'll buy that in a heartbeat. I'll accept it. Yeah, yes they were. Yes, sir. You could be say in a dream and hear Frank spoke. Yeah. Where'd that come from? Yeah. You know what I mean? You hear it all spoken to you or something you never knew before, but where did all that come from? You can't limit God. And you can't limit him to your experience. That's a horrible thing to do. But the Bible says to profit with all. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. All right, Brother Moore dismisses, please.
Christ. Thank you.